when he runs to the aid of a neighbour being robbed, a man has his throat slashed. Ripped his throat out, leaving a massive, gaping, open wound across the throat from which no one could possibly survive. The killer is 55-year-old Ian McLaughlin. After 21 years in prison for two previous killings, the parole board decides he should be prepared for release. The double killer is given unsupervised leave for a weekend with catastrophic results. Ian McLaughlin had brutally killed two men before. Why was this convicted killer allowed back on the streets, released to kill for a third time? One in five murders in the UK is now committed by an ex-prisoner. From serial rapists, he harboured dark thoughts about carrying out sexual offences. To convicted killers. They'd met in prison. They were out on the streets together. Free to walk amongst us. They knew he could have killed again. Free to murder innocent people. She stabbed him many times, and then she hit him in a wheelie bin. I'm Donald McIntyre, and I'm examining how such tragedies happen. Who's to blame? Is it the justice system? Or are these killers just pure evil? She gained pleasure from hurting people. And ultimately, could an innocent life have been saved? This is Release to Kill. Ian John McLaughlin was born in Barrow and Furness, Lancashire, in 1958. As a child, he was astonishingly bright with an IQ of 140. McLaughlin was assessed by a psychiatrist who thought either he'd be a top barrister or a threat to society. There were signs early on that McLaughlin had violent tendencies. His sister reported that he used to put rubber balls in the fire and throw them at her. When he turned about 13, he started getting into trouble at school and was then, from those moments, he became a bit of a ticking time bomb. He soon goes off the rails. Much of his youth is spent in care homes, and he picks up a string of convictions for petty theft and burglary. By his early 20s, he's living in London. McLaughlin became a drifter. Reportedly, he became a rent boy and started sleeping rough. Then, at 25, he gets married. It doesn't last long. His marriage quickly collapsed as he turned to alcoholism and a life of crime and prostitution. Things reach ahead in Stoke Newington, London, in October 1983. The police arrest him after he crashes a stolen car while drunk. Taken to a cell to sober up, McLaughlin demanded to see the custody sergeant, and he told him, I've done a bad thing. McLaughlin confesses to killing a gay man, 49-year-old Len Delgatti. He smashes his skull seven times with a hammer and strangles him with a towel. It was believed the two were having a sexual relationship, but McLaughlin hid the body in the cupboard and made good his escape. McLaughlin is charged with murder and sent to trial. He tells the court that Delgatti played him an audio tape in which Delgatti fantasized about having sex with an underage boy. As a result of hearing that tape, McLaughlin claims that he struck out uh, in, in, in retaliation, basically, for the, what he considered to be uh, uh, this terrible tape, and that's how the killing came about. This is crucial. McLaughlin will go on to plead guilty to manslaughter, but not murder. The defence is based on the proposition that the killing was pursuant to some form of provocation. Serious violence, a long spell of taunts, belittlement, psychological pressure, any, any range of influences that, 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 that the jury might feel led the defendant to lose their self-control by reason of provocation. The defence is known as diminished responsibility, and the court is advised by two independent psychiatrists. In this country, where you have two psychiatric experts agreeing that a defendant was diminished, 
Uh, it's a pretty foolproof state of affairs. Just to be clear, the, the position in relation to experts is that they're independent. It's, it's a very robust system which is based on integrity and professionalism. I've never been in a case where it's been suggested that the defence have manipulated the system. No, ever. McLaughlin's defence claims he was provoked to attack because he found Delgatti's tape about underage homosexual sex so offensive. His defence is a calculated one. In the 1980s, there was considerable homophobia. A local government act of 1988 even made it illegal for local authorities to promote homosexuality or its acceptance. I get the impression that McLaughlin is gay himself, but I also wonder how comfortable he is about being gay, whether, you know, whether the conflicts inside himself are part of what drives his criminal behaviour. Some people are more comfortable in their sexuality, I think. Some people are more comfortable in their own skin. I, I sense that he's not one of those people and, and that, you know, he, he is, for want of a better phrase, bedeviled by demons. Thanks to the general public's prejudice against homosexuality at the time, many jurors might have sympathised with McLaughlin's defence, believing he was deeply disturbed by the tape Delgatti played him. He escapes a murder charge and is sentenced to 13 years in prison for manslaughter, later reduced to eight on appeal. Ian McLaughlin is a man with a frightening capacity for violence. What has made him so dangerous? And can anything be done to change his behaviour? To discuss the case, Dr Shahom Daz, a forensic psychiatrist, and Vanessa Frake, a retired prison governor, join me in the crime hub. In respect of McLaughlin here, he was violent from quite a young age and to close family members. Yeah, and that's, that's not unusual in these sorts of cases where violence has always been a part of life. And I do wonder whether some, an explanation for him acting out violently towards family members might be rooted in the fact that he was taken into care at such a young age. So I'm sure he would have felt a sense of rejection and perhaps resentment. His first conviction for manslaughter really came out of the blue, and yet it still reveals so much about his character and the complexity and the challenges. So my understanding is that his victim was homosexual, and I do wonder whether McLaughlin himself was both homosexual and paradoxically homophobic. So I think he had what we call in psychiatry cognitive dissonance. So he has these conflicting beliefs and ideas and behaviours, and as you say, that must have caused some mental anguish. And the circumstances in which he confessed to this murder were very unusual. Yes, I believe he was um, stopped by um, police for a traffic offence and, and just blurted out that he'd killed this man. Um, and uh, the police went to his address and the, this, this guy was found turned upside down in a, in a cupboard. The phrase when I look at this and how he killed in this instance, the phrase overkill comes to mind. He hit him over the head several times with a hammer and then um, to doubly make sure that um, Delgatti was dead, he strangled him. So yes, overkill it describes the, 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 the anger almost that he felt at this, at this body. We know that McLaughlin struggled with his sexuality and he claims that his victim was also gay. So I wonder whether there was some self-loathing and self-hatred that he was projecting onto his victim, seeing him as a version of himself that he wanted to damage and, want, and wanted to hurt. This is 1984, and the views around homosexuality and sexuality in general were, you know, pretty prehistoric in terms of today. Uh, I agree, and I think it just it speaks to the pressures that McLaughlin was probably facing in terms of what his acceptable behaviour and being accepted by society as a whole. I suppose. I mean, in drama, we oh, love the idea of an evil genius and manipulative murderer, but, you know, it's very rare you get somebody of a genius-level IQ committing murder. It's just very few high-functioning individuals end up uh, in, uh, in jail, I presume. Well, I, I'm not sure that's, that's a correct statement. To my mind, prisoners are very clever. You know, you could say, well, they're not that clever because they got caught, but... Um, 
they're quite manipulative, quite deceptive. To even sort of think of uh, an excuse to, to kill somebody is, is, is quite um, intelligent in itself. Absolutely. I, I think when we look at McLaughlin's background, and he, he came from such a chaotic, deprived background with going in and out of care, being homeless for a time, being a rent boy, I wonder if he felt even more isolated than than other people in that situation because of his high IQ. And as you say, another element might be his ability to deceive and manipulate. So that, that might have had an impact on, on how he came across to the jury. It, it seems to indicate that, although clearly a violent man, he was able to play the system. I think that's very likely. I think people who have an IQ like McLaughlin did would be well versed in knowing exactly what to say and when to say it. Ian McLaughlin will be released from prison after serving just five years. Within two, he'll kill again. This time, the brutal murder of a gay man. Ian McLaughlin is a unique killer. He has a near genius IQ, but since the age of 13 has lived a life of crime, prostitution and alcoholism. He commits his first murder at the age of 26, targeting a gay man he claims to be a paedophile. McLaughlin is released in April 1989. After serving just five years of his eight-year sentence, he's now back on the streets. He sets up home in Brighton, well known for its gay community. I think if you were gay in the 1980s or at the start of the 1990s, there were still places that weren't very receptive. I think Brighton was a fairly safe place to be gay. McLaughlin gets a job in a bar owned by 54-year-old Peter Halls. He had three local sort of pubs and bars, if you like, uh, in, all in the town centre. So he a reasonably successful local businessman. I, I sense Halls had taken McLaughlin under his wing. Hall offers McLaughlin accommodation in his flat, and before long, they start a sexual relationship. For 17 months, everything appears to go well. Then one day in September 1990, McLaughlin suddenly becomes extremely violent. They were having sex when uh, McLaughlin killed Halls. So McLaughlin asked Halls to lay face down on the bed and then stabbed him. He stabs him through the neck with such force that the knife comes out the other side. McLaughlin then steals luxury goods worth thousands of pounds and flees the scene. He has a history of offending, not just violent offending, but other acquisitive offending. He's committed to very serious crimes. We can, we can clearly say that he has antisocial personality traits. And what we know in those with antisocial personality disorder is that their brains are actually structured in a different way. Um, so the consequences of punishment don't get processed in the same way that you or I might process them. So what this means is that consequence doesn't have consequence. When police track him down, McLaughlin claims that because Halls was his employer, he was expected to sleep with him. It's not a, a new phenomenon. What we've seen with the Me Too movement, you know, there, there are jobs, there are relationships, power imbalances where impressions can be given implicitly or explicitly, but equally with someone like McLaughlin, who's a very clever individual. You can easily imagine that it's a, a plausible line that he would spin as part of a, a, an attempt to try to get himself out of the trouble he was in. At his trial, McLaughlin also claims that Halls was a paedophile. If he was hoping to gain the jury's sympathy, this time it doesn't work. In July 1992, McLaughlin is convicted of murder. He receives a life sentence with a minimum of 14 years to serve. Ian McLaughlin now goes on to murder someone else. Now appears as if the first manslaughter conviction was an unfortunate mistake. He's now killed his partner, his gay partner, and stabbed him three times in the neck. I think what's, what confuses me is the trigger for this particular incident. So we know that he was in a relationship with this man for around 17 months. So it's very possible that, similar to the first circumstance, 
he might have uh, been both homosexual and homophobic, so he might have had some conflicting emotions and some self-loathing and some self-hatred. Having said that, what's less clear is why it took him 17 months to get to that point. This says to me that this is a guy with a penchant for violence, intimate violence, uh, then I think that he may have manipulated the first court into a manslaughter conviction rather than a murder conviction. Then after that, he managed to get his sentence shortened at the appeal. So I wonder whether this gave him the confidence and emboldened him to go on and commit murder again, thinking that potentially he might be able to play the system for a second time. So he not only succeeded in getting a murder charge reduced to manslaughter and then uh, a 13 or 14 year sentence reduced to eight years and then to serve five, but on his next conviction for murder, he succeeded in getting that reduced from a minimum of 25 to um, a minimum of 14. And certainly in his case, um, I, I think that his IQ was a factor. He didn't really have any sort of inhibitions to murdering again because he, he, he thought that he knew how to play the system. How unusual is it for somebody to have committed a manslaughter slash murder and then to come back into the system um, uh, having committed a second murder? It's not co a common practice, for sure. Um, it is very unusual. Um, but that said, I mean, there have been instances where people have gone out, committed murder and come back, but it is more unusual than usual. McLaughlin is serving life for a second killing, but proves to be the model prisoner. He behaves well, and it's reported that he has a particularly good work ethic. Is this behaviour genuine, or is he just out to fool the authorities? With only two years of his minimum 14-year life sentence left to serve, McLaughlin has been moved to an open prison, Kirkham near Blackpool in Lancashire. The aim of an open prison is to prepare prisoners for release back into society. Initially, what happens is you, you, you come from the closed prison and, and, and you, you, you're in the prison for a little while. You start to go out to do community work in the outside community, probably supervised to begin with by an officer. Then you're trusted to go out just on your own, paint a community centre or dig holes for pensioners, or, you know, do some, do some sort of voluntary work. For many prisoners, it's a huge shock going from a closed to an open prison. It's, I can't explain to you how amazing it is, how exhilarating it is. It's incredibly emotional. This is where people think, you know, prison's a holiday camp. You're there as a punishment, you lose your liberty. Losing your liberty as a human being, being a captive, is a hell of a, it's a, hell of a thing to, to cope with and to adapt to. The impact of moving from closed to open conditions can't be overestimated. Um, a lot of people really struggle with this, and particularly those with personality disorder or personality difficulties, because what those type of people need is containment. Rules and boundaries make them feel quite safe, and suddenly you're in an environment with far fewer rules and boundaries, and that can be incredibly destabilising. Despite the challenges, McLaughlin appears to handle the change and is well on his way to early release. Then, a fellow prisoner accuses him of sexual assault. On one of his working days away from prison, he absconds. Issues of absconction within open prisons are really interesting because somebody is essentially setting themselves up. They know that through absconding, they are going to be removed from open conditions, put back into closed conditions, and they're going to be in for a longer time than they would have been otherwise. And I would suggest, if we're thinking about issues of institutionalization, absconction is really key, because perhaps that individual, even on an unconscious level, wants to stay in prison. It does suggest that McLaughlin had an unstable personality, unstable thought process about what was in his interests. McLaughlin is on the run for three days before police catch up with him. He was re-arrested and realised that his, uh, he would have to serve a considerably longer sentence now because of uh, uh, that decision. He changed his mindset completely and he now uh, became very much more cooperative. He showed remorse uh, for what he'd done. 
McLaughlin is returned to a closed prison to work his way back towards parole. It's a slow process, but finally he appears ready to move on. Six years after absconding from day release, he's transferred to Spring Hill Open Prison in Buckinghamshire. There, he's part of what's known as a therapeutic community. It's the only prison in the country where, where the whole prison is geared for therapy to, to help people to understand why they committed the crimes they committed and to, you know, work out ways to not commit crime, not hurt people in the future. And so part of the, part of the uh, program for getting to Spring Hill is to, is, to, is to demonstrate that you no longer present a risk to society. There are entire prisons set up to be a therapeutic community, and this means that the therapy is happening 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are expected to um, take an active part in the community that you live in. You are involved in the decision-making process. You're essentially being reparented and reintroduced into a pro-social society, but this is costly and it takes time. You're looking at a minimum of four years um, and the costs far exceed that of a standard prison placement. A few months after arriving at Spring Hill, McLaughlin is again trusted to leave prison on unsupervised day release. On the 16th of April 2011, the convicted killer fails to return. He's always struggled with an alcohol problem and has been drinking. You have an officer, usually called the Terminator, who will come and find you at your, work of play, your place of work or your community place. Uh, and just make sure you're there, make sure you're where you're supposed to be, you know, you're, not, you know, beha you're behaving properly. And so, uh, again, um, you know, the conditions, no, no alcohol. Often you'll be, there'll be random breathalyzing tests as you go back to the jail at night. Police are called to a house after reports of two men rowing. McLaughlin is arrested for being drunk and disorderly. He isn't charged, but once again, deemed unsuitable for parole and has moved back to a closed Category C prison. How does an open prison work? An open prison still has a, um, like a fence around it. it. The cells aren't locked. They're not so much cells, they're more rooms. It's much more prisoners cook for themselves. Um, that they, they can apply for temporary release. And it would start off where he might go out for half a day. So he might go out at, at 9 o'clock in the morning and come back at, at 12 o'clock midday and gradually work to... to having overnight stays to having, um, like, a weekend pass. And is there a sense that your first time out you'd be accompanied by a prison officer? No. Not... You may get an attempt, a temporary release accompanied, um, but that just... It actually means what it is. That, that prison officer is, is not um, required to run after a prisoner. Um, if he goes, he goes. Uh, he is sent to an open prison and he has his first taste of freedom. He's released for the day and what happens? So he goes out drinking, doesn't come back in time and then is recalled and his, his leaves are stopped. This is quite surprising to me because it doesn't fit his previous pattern. We get the picture of a man who's quite intelligent, who's quite capable, who's quite manipulative and is good at playing the system. However, it does seem that on, on this occasion he gets his first taste of freedom and he, he just goes a bit wild. So I wonder if he was locked up for such a long period of time, he was institutionalised for such a, such a lengthy period that he just couldn't contain his, his, his urges, he just wanted to go out and drink at the risk of being recalled back. McLaughlin is back in a closed prison, but it won't be long before he'll persuade the parole board again that it's safe to let him out on licensed day release. Once again, it shows how cleverly he can play the system with fatal consequences. Arrested for being drunk and disorderly while on day release, convicted killer Ian McLaughlin is moved from Spring Hill Open Prison to a closed prison, Little Hay, in Cambridgeshire, to begin the parole process for the third time. Little Hay Prison only holds offenders who've been convicted of a sexual offence. Here, in 2011, he meets 85-year-old Francis Corey Wright. 
He was in his 80s, but had been jailed for a historic sex offence against a 10-year-old boy back in the 1970s. And somehow it became known to other inmates that he was exceedingly rich. McLaughlin appears to befriend Corey Wright, but in reality, he's marked him out as a perfect target for robbery. Back in closed prison, McLaughlin once again plays the model prisoner. Two years later, in 2013, he returns to Springhill Open Prison to prepare him for a possible full release on license. Five months after arriving, the parole board grant him RSD, resettlement day release. It's common practice at Springhill for this to take the form of unaccompanied weekend visits to town. He was in many respects a model prisoner and very bright. Equally, when he had the chance to come out on day release or on temporary license, he seemed very capable of breaking just about every rule going. The minute he's out, uh, any, any trust that he's built, uh, he quickly um, be betrays or destroys. On Saturday, the 13th of July, 2013, double murderer McLaughlin walks through the gates of Springhill Open Prison with his weekend fully planned. He knows exactly where he's headed and the crime he's going to commit. First, he hitches a lift to nearby Hertfordshire. Then he books into a hotel for the night. The next day, he puts his plan into action. He heads to the home of the wealthy paedophile he met in prison, Francis Corey Wright, now 87 years old. Over a cup of tea, McLaughlin tells Corey Wright he's setting up a charity to support elderly ex-offenders. Suddenly, the mood changes. Uh, once he'd, uh, McLaughlin had gained entry into uh, this really quite big and spacious house, he uh, grabbed uh, Corey Wright, who was in his 80s and uh, vulnerable, in no position to resist uh, quite a vicious attack from a uh, fit 50-year-old uh, man. Uh, he was tied to his bed and forced to, uh, uh, to reveal where the family jewels were, the, in, in the, the rich pickings. Uh, McLaughlin shouted at him over and over again, where's the silver and gold? Where's the silver and gold? He runs around the house, stuffing valuables into a pillowcase. He then went back to the bedroom and demanded from uh, Corey Wright, what's your bank account? What's your pin numbers? I want them now. And this terrified man who couldn't uh, uh, bring any sort of figures to mind because he was rightly in fear of his life. While McLaughlin ransacks the house for valuables, Corey Wright manages to break free and shout for help. One of Corey Wright's neighbours heard the commotion and came to see what was going on or came to help. He was he described as a good Samaritan grandpa, a you know, decent guy who's just come to help out when he sounds like a neighbour's in distress. 66-year-old Graham Buck, a father of three and recent grandfather, arrives at the front door. McLaughlin bursts out and the men tussle. Uh, an elderly man in, with no fit state to fight back dragged him back inside the house and ripped his throat out, it's, uh, it, it, leaving a massive, gaping, open wound across the throat from which no one could possibly survive. You know, this is a very quick and brutal and effective attack in terms of enabling McLaughlin to get away. McLaughlin makes his escape. McLaughlin uh, had not come to murder, but he had murdered, and he, he knew it. He made his escape with the, uh, the loot uh, and made his way off to London to stay at uh, a friend's house. He was off away, and he was going to enjoy his last days of freedom. McLaughlin proved untrustworthy and unreliable in unsupervised day release. Yet, he was allowed out to kill another innocent man in a shocking attack. Is there a major flaw in the parole system? Or was this third murder something that could never have been anticipated? It seems extraordinary that 
His first murder, he bashes him in the head dozens of times and then strangles him uh, with a towel. Next murder, he stabs his partner three times in the neck. And in this case, he slashes Mr. Buck's throat. I mean, quite, still quite personal, intimate crimes. You know, he's watching and looking in the eyes of his victims. I think the third one in particular, it seems that he panicked to a degree. So he was suddenly disturbed. He had this plan in his head. As far as we know, he might have been planning this for quite a long period of time, having all this time to self-reflect in prison, and it suddenly goes wrong. So it seems like it's reactive to the situation. It w was it likely that the victim of theft, that he uh, was very lucky to escape with his life? It would seem likely to me. I think it's, it's very possible that he might have intended to kill this man, especially because this man is a convicted paedophile. And from what we know about his McLaughlin's hang-ups, about his sexuality, and he seems preoccupied with with sexuality and with sexual offending. I wonder if McLaughlin, because of the struggles with his own sexuality, already comes from a place where there's some self-loathing. So he's almost looking for somebody that in his mind is, uh, is, is less worthy than him so that he can take out his pent up frustration and anger. He's looking for a victim. If anything, it, it, it almost seems that he's more volatile by the third murder rather than, than usually like when when murderers have, have have killed and they've settled down they've done their sentence and they a lot of them turn their lives around obviously you're not going to have a hundred percent but in his case it seems like he's just going up a level every single time because now he's killed somebody who has actually nothing to do with what his his first intention was here you have somebody who you know for the best part of 40 years you know, had a crime-free life, except every once in a while, every decade or 15 years or so, he commits murder. And that's the problem in, in managing his risk. Somebody who has periods of seemingly normal behavior with no violent reactions and then suddenly has these flashes of extreme violence occasionally is so much harder to predict if and when that's going to happen. I think by uh, camouflaging his violence and his murders with the ambiguity of society, the ambiguity around sexuality and uh, homosexuality at the time, that really kind of diluted the severity and I think minimized the risks that he presented to society. It was a smart move for the defendant. I agree with you, but I suppose the counter argument would be that that his killings were in the context of his discomfort with his sexuality. So another way to, to, to say that would be he possibly wouldn't have chosen the victims he had chosen had it not been for either the discomfort that he's got about his own sexuality or this extreme judgment that he has against child sex offenders. Two murders. Is it really possible to release somebody after committing two murders? Personal thoughts are that I, I wouldn't have released him after after two, but if he's played the system, if he's ticked the boxes, where do you go with somebody like that who hasn't got, don't forget, he hasn't got a whole life tariff? And that's that's not the prison, that is the, the judicial system. The prison system is built upon the hope, the expectation that we can repair these damaged lives, we can bring the lost sheep back into the flock most of the time. But fundamentally, that works for some people, but clearly in this case, not everyone. I think the problem is, is that with, with this particular presentation, it's really hard to know for definite what the future's gonna hold. It's, it's hard to predict this kind of risk. So if you have somebody that does low-level offending regularly, then it's much easier to predict future risk. And I do think that there, there is an ethos towards rehabilitation. I think this is one of those exceptional cases where a leopard has never changed his spots. McLaughlin has killed for the third time and has seemingly disappeared. A nationwide manhunt is underway to track the fugitive down and return him to prison before another innocent life is lost. With McLaughlin's whereabouts unknown, the police warn the public to be on a high alert. This is somebody who's been convicted of two killings, one a manslaughter, one a murder. A very bright guy, a psychopath, you know, someone even his own sister would describe as dangerous and uh, who has been assessed as being a very sort of dangerous offender for many, many years uh, out there. Nobody knows where he is. 
Three days after the murder of grandfather Graham Buck in Hertfordshire, the police get a lucky break. A patrol is called to a disturbance at a house in London. There were reports of uh, uh, drinking, swearing, shouting coming from a, a house. Uh, when police were called, uh, they uh, arrested or into the, uh, those responsible, and one of them was Ian McLaughlin. McLaughlin seemed not to care that he was caught. Uh, he knew that his time was up and that uh, it was only a matter of time before uh, he would be rearrested. So he was determined that his last moments of freedom would be used with drinks and drugs and having the time uh, to make up for all those years behind bars. On the 21st of October 2013, McLaughlin goes on trial at the Old Bailey. He looks surprisingly calm. I expected a burly, thick-set, thuggish, criminal, uh, career criminal. And what I saw was a, a, a slimmer man, almost, uh, uh, he had a sort of, almost an air of serenity about him, that he was coolness. It was, uh, he didn't seem het up in the slightest. He didn't seem uh, in any way th to be troubled. It's expected that McLaughlin would plead guilty to manslaughter. In murder cases, the defendant has to be shown to have intended to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. In manslaughter cases, they have to be, it has, it has to be proved that they simply intended some harm at the time of the killing. The biggest surprise on the day is that McLaughlin pleads guilty to murder. It's very, very uncommon for defendants to plead guilty to murder. I've had someone plead guilty to two murders. Um, and that's the only case I've personally been involved in where it happened. And I suspect that's because the facts of each case were very compelling against the defendant. Tactically, I could see the point of why he did it when overwhelmingly uh, the evidence was stacked against him. But this is still very rare for anyone to plead guilty to murder. Murder trials can go on for months. McLaughlin's lasts just one day. We didn't get a peep out of McLaughlin uh, during his time uh, in the dock. He didn't seem to uh, react to anything. The defense was short, uh, no witnesses were called, and uh, the judge passed sentence in the afternoon. The sentence passed down by judge, Mr. Justice Sweeney, causes controversy. He doesn't give McLaughlin a whole life tariff. A whole life tariff means exactly that. It means that the individual who is sentenced to a whole life tariff will remain in custody for the rest of their lives. The judge argues that a decision by the European Court of Human Rights supersedes British law. In 2008, the European Court ruled that life means life sentences were a breach of human rights because they gave a prisoner no possibility or hope of release. So on that basis, he declined to issue a full life uh, term, and he set the minimum sentence at 40 years. That meant that he would not be eligible for parole until he was 95. And there is no way any prisoner gets to the age of 95 behind bars. So it mattered little to McLaughlin, but it caused a huge outcry because here's a man who was killed three times. And that almost always results up until that time in a full life tariff. Eventually, the Attorney General overturns the original sentence and imposes a full life tariff. McLaughlin has brutally killed twice before, yet he's allowed out on unsupervised release. A day later, an innocent man who comes to the rescue of a neighbor has his throat cut. What went wrong with the justice system? And why was McLaughlin released to kill? So what do you think are the key lost opportunities in respect of his criminal career and the intervention of the criminal justice system that might have saved the other two lives after his first conviction for manslaughter? I think that the missed opportunities were potentially giving him longer sentences in the first place. So arguably he shouldn't have got a manslaughter charge for the very first killing, it should have been murder. And even in the second murder conviction he could have had a longer sentence. And then, whilst he was in prison, the rehabilitation could have been a bit more intense. And finally, and perhaps most significantly, I think that one of the big failures 
was giving him day release, this release on temporary license, when he had failed a couple of times previously within the earlier few years. I mean, he failed while on day release, but he didn't fail with acts of violence. It was more behavioral. It was alcohol returning late. It seems that this is a highly unique situation. It's a super bright uh, and highly manipulative uh, inmate. Absolutely. But was he pushing, pushing the boundaries to see how far he could go? You know, having a drink whilst out on a licence, everybody knows, you know, that's the first thing you say to a prisoner when you discharge him out the gate. You are not permitted alcohol or drugs on your temporary release. Um, you know, but he seemed to just push the boundaries, push the boundaries every single time. This was a perfect storm of a highly manipulative, super bright offender, social circumstances, discomfort around sexuality and homosexuality, and of course the uniqueness that he was law-abiding, you know, for 40 years, except for the three instances when he committed murder. He could fool anybody, he, and, and clearly he did, you know, he, he fooled the experts, because they believed that the, the risk was reduced, and clearly, unfortunately, it wasn't. He was smarter than the system. Absolutely. And the inquest found that there was a catalogue of failings which resulted in his release, day release, from prison without a proper assessment of the risks which, with catastrophic uh, consequences. Yeah, I mean, there can be no more catastrophic uh, consequence than somebody being murdered when really they shouldn't have been. I agree. I think, I think it goes without saying that the consequences of him going through the system and being released are absolutely extreme. But I'd also say that it's, it's because of his presentation, it's actually quite hard to know exactly when to release him. So if somebody is playing by the rules, if they're not breaching boundaries in prison, then at what point do you know that they're safe? So what do we learn from this? Is he such an outlier case that there's very little that can be learned? I do think any time you have a case of such extreme violence, and when it happens in such an unpredictable manner, with such long periods of time in between, it means that we are very bad at predicting that risk. So I think the thing we can learn is knowing our limits and knowing when we can and we can't predict future risk. The answer is two strikes, you commit murder two times, you're definitely never gonna see the light of day again. I think in this circumstances, I would agree with you, I think most people would, but there might be another set of circumstances. This could have been somebody who was embroiled in gang culture, killed two people as a teenager, either on the same day or, you know, a couple of weeks apart, that might be a different set of circumstances where there is some hope for rehabilitation down the line. What comfort do we take from the fact that he'll never see the light of day again? So for me, what really strikes me about this case and what we cannot forget is the family of the third victim, Mr. Buck. The trauma and the suffering they've gone through. Because he was killed in such a senseless way, he was actually trying to help out. He was the good Samaritan in this scenario. And then for them to look back and find out that the perpetrator had killed twice before, I'm sure that no amount of explanation or risk assessment or management uh, would ever make up for the pain they've been through. And I don't think that there's, there's any amount of apologies that, that are going to make that decision to release him on that day any easier. You know, um, and um, my heart goes out to the, to the family. As she left the original murder trial, Graham Buck's widow briefed the press. She's insisted that there was many questions left unanswered, and she really wanted to know answers to how this man had been released. A later review by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Prisons was highly critical of the release on temporary license system and the freedom it had allowed McLaughlin. It concluded that it was not appropriate to release Mr. McLaughlin. The risks he presented on release on temporary license were not sufficiently assessed or managed. One thing that uh, struck me was just how similar uh, a person like Graham Buck was, say, with my own father. I could imagine him being in his garden and hearing a cries for help and it, without thinking immediately going to see if he could help. And if you put yourself in that position, just how a kindly old man meets his death, it is absolutely horrific. <laughs>